Hey, greetings, everyone. Lieutenant Colonel Allen West, and welcome to the Steadfast and Loyal Podcast. You gotta light them up before they burn it down. This episode of the Steadfast and Loyal Podcast is brought to us by the United States Concealed Carry Association, and they literally help to save lives. And let me explain. The USCCA is a membership association that provides self-defense education, training, and peace of mind to over 500,000 responsibly armed Americans nationwide. Click learn more below right now if you are ready to start your journey with them. When you activate your membership, you'll get access to expert self-defense education, life-saving training, and self-defense liability insurance. These resources are literally life-saving, and the USCCA has first-person testimonies to proving it. With your membership, you'll get access to hundreds of hours of training videos, articles, checklists, guides, and more. You'll be able to get instant up-to-date information about everything from gun laws to ammo types to home defense drills, self-defense drills. And best of all, it's 100% risk-free with the United States Concealed Carry Association's money-back bulletproof, no pun intended, guarantee. That means that if you decide the USCCA isn't for you. Simply call, request a prompt and courteous refund. So what are you waiting for? Click learn more below right now. And remember the USCCA is not an insurance company. A policy has been issued to the USCCA by Universal Fire and Casualty Insurance Company. That policy provides the association and its members with self-defense liability insurance subject to its terms, conditions, limitations and exclusions and remember with your membership you also get this fantastic magazine conceal carry this is the november december 2022 edition so this is the last one for this calendar year i'm looking forward to january and february a lot of great information join the united states conceal carry association and keep yourself protected because it is a constitutional right You know, I was born and raised there in Georgia, the Peach State. Dad grew up uh, just south of Columbus in a little county called Randolph County, Cuthbert, Georgia. I remember growing up and going with granddad and dad and fishing at places like Hog Creek, Lake Eufaula, catching some brim and crappie. Mom grew up just south of Macon, Georgia, nice little place called Fort Valley State. Well, nice little place called Fort Valley, Georgia, and it's affectionately called the Peach County. I remember picking peaches as a kid. Maybe that's one of the reasons I don't care for peaches right now because of peach fuzz, and I remember scratching to death in the middle of the night. But I have fond memories about being brought up there in Georgia. Born in 1961 in a blacks-only hospital, grew up in the old Fourth Ward neighborhood in Atlanta, the same neighborhood that produced Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., my elementary school. Our lady of Lures Catholic School was right across the street from Ebenezer Baptist Church. So you can kind of imagine that the state where my mom and dad are laid to rest there in Marietta National Cemetery, home of what used to be the Big Chicken. I looked at the Georgia runoff race, and it meant a lot to me, not just the fact that I know Herschel Walker personally, but I'm just very concerned about the largest landmass state east of the Mississippi River, 159 counties in the state of Georgia. But it appears that just several counties are the ones that are having this severe impact on the political direction of the state of Georgia. And so there have been a lot of people talking about what happened, what's been going on, who's to blame and everything. I just want to give you my insights, thoughts, and perspectives about what happened in the Senate race and the Senate runoff race in the state of Georgia. 
I still have many friends that are there, of course, relatives. I'm the former chairman of the Texas Republican Party, and so I have contacts back there with the Georgia Republican Party to include the chairman emeritus, I call him, and that's Chairman Padgett, incredible man, great mentor to me. And so when I sit and think about what occurred, first and foremost, you just have to ask yourself, how could it be that in a general election where Governor Brian Kemp is running against a person, Stacey Abrams, and defeats her soundly by, I think, almost, what, half a million votes or something like that? I mean, it was a pretty good sizable margin after all the stuff about Jim Crow 2.0 and all this but yet there was a 200,000-vote discrepancy, disparity, whatever you want to call it, between Governor Kemp and Herschel Walker. For whatever reason, you know, I think it has to do a lot with the fact that Herschel was a selectee of Donald Trump, and Donald Trump and Brian Kemp are not on the best of terms. That happened in the general election. Governor Kemp did not campaign with Herschel Walker in the general election. He did come out in the runoff and cut some ads for him and show support. But that should have happened in the general election. we got to be focused on what's best for the state of Georgia, what's best for the United States of America. we got to start putting these petty personality you know, conflagrations beside, aside. But when you peel the onion back and you think about what really – happened in Georgia. I just don't think that the Republican Party, I don't know, being it there in Georgia, definitely the RNC, they understand that there is some low-hanging fruit that is out there. And that is in the black community. You know, I, I don't know if there was really that you know, wholehearted desire to engage. I hate the word outreach. I just despise the word outreach. Outreach means you show up in Hispanic America month, Black History Month, Asian Pacific whatever month, and you act like, you know, you're simpatico, and then people never hear from you again until ah, 90 days before the election. But this has to be about continuous and constant engagement, and especially on the issues. And, and I'll give it to you. When Donald Trump was there in North Carolina and he made that challenge to the black community, what do you have to lose? He was absolutely right, but he backed it up with his policies. You saw the low unemployment in the black community. You saw the uh, the enterprise zones trying to, you know, stir up small business growth and entrepreneurship. You saw the criminal justice reform. You saw the support to historical black colleges and universities. So why was that missing in the state of Georgia in this election cycle? You know, there's a great article out there on TimCast that kind of looked at some of the things uh, speaking to people on the ground. And I wholeheartedly concur with that article. And one of the things that they brought out and, you know, that I saw and knew and was aware of, there was that, not that engagement. I mean, Herschel Walker, you, you can't make like the guy is not black. I know that so many people saying, we don't want to talk about being black. We want to be e pluribus unum. I, I got it. I understand that. You don't want to get into identity politics, but you cannot deny who you are. I'll never forget when I was in Northwestern University speaking on the Iranian nuclear agreement, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. This young lady, maybe y'all sent it out there on video. I, everyone says it's on TikTok. This young lady comes up to me and asks me, do I identify as black? One of the dumbest questions I ever heard in my life. Because there are some people that believe your skin color dictates how you're supposed to think. I'm not into the groupthink thing. But what we have to understand is that if you continue to want to cast aside the tactics and the procedures and the processes and, you know, the techniques of the other side, you're not going to be successful. We can break down this whole thing about identity politics by showing that we're not about identity politics, but we're about people, as Dr. King said, it's about the content of their character, not the color of their skin. And that's what we have to do. And we have to show that in these communities from which people emanate from. And I just don't think that the Republicans have gotten to understand that yet. So you can't run away from the black community. As a matter of fact, the black community wants you to run to them. I'm sitting here wondering why we've got these documentaries that were done here in Dallas by Justin Malone, Malone Productions, uh, produced by 
Larry Elder, Uncle Tom and Uncle Tom too. Those things should be shown all across the United States of America. The RNC should be sponsoring those things because it talks about truth. It talks about history. It talks about relationships. It talks about policies, philosophies of governance, how it's affected the black community. That's how you have engagement, by talking about the issue. That's how you make sure that someone can go out there and run as who they are. Not just a, an athlete to carry the ball, got the Heisman Trophy, won a national championship, but a person that's been a successful business owner. Get him into the communities. Thanksgiving Day, when the West family was up there in the Great Smoky Mountains, I, I just couldn't believe that I did not hear or see about Herschel Walker in the black community on Thanksgiving Day or at a homeless shelter in the inner cities. That's how you break down this identity politics thing. And, of course, the, the left is always, you know, Joy Reid and all the other charlatans. They're always going to come out and say what they got to say. But so what? Continue to show up and to be there. And there are those people that are out there saying, well, you know, Herschel won the greatest candidate and all this type of stuff. Well, I remember when I got selected to be a battalion commander in the, in the Army, I had to go to battalion commander charm school, my wife and I. What kind of little program do we have to make sure that we can get people in two or three hours a day? Talk to them about the issues. Get them educated. Get them to understand those processes. Because I think that there are some people that look at Herschel and said. I don't know if he could sit there and be the guy that is asking questions during a Senate committee hearing. But someone should have tried to spin him up, get him educated on these things so he can articulate about it. I mean, he had the heart that was there. Just get him up to speed on these issues. How often did we see Mitch McConnell down there? How often did we see all of these senators Every single Republican senator should have been in Georgia for this runoff election. Where else were they going to be? To talk about how important it is. To talk about how it's important to have that 50-50 so Chuck Schumer doesn't have subpoena powers. Chuck Schumer doesn't have committee jurisdiction as far as uh, chairmanships. I remember seeing and hearing of that. So it's real easy to cast blame on the guy that steps up and says, you know, I I'll go run and I'll do it. And everyone should have been putting their arms around it, to include the person that put him up to run for it, not just sitting back and waiting to see what the outcome was. But we got to do better, you know, in a, NRSC, National Republican Senatorial Committee, RNC. But I don't know if they get it. I, I, I'm, I'm sick and tired of people saying you, you can't win in the black community. It's not about winning over a whole community. But if you can go into those major urban population centers, the Atlanta metropolitan area, Macon, Columbus, Savannah, Augusta, and you get percentage. I think President Trump last time out, 2020, I believe he got like 15 to 18 percent in the black community. That's huge. I believe you can get 20 to 25 percent, especially when you look at what is happening with the crime issue, which mainly affects people in these type of areas. But to sit back and, and just say that, you know, it's just the candidate. No, there was a whole panoply of failures that were there in Georgia. You know, I always tell people that there are two aspects to a candidate, two aspects to a campaign, whatever you call it, it's image and message. We got to do better by getting our message out there. I mean, they painted Herschel Walker into a box. It was hard for him to break out of it, kind of like putting all 11 up there on the, uh, in the line of scrimmage. But what we've got to do is talk about what we're for, and we've got to prop up our candidates so that they can rise above that. Raphael Warnock is not some saint, especially when you consider the fact that he calls himself a reverend, a pastor, a minister. I mean, here's a guy that is the senior pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church, who supports murdering unborn babies by dismembering them in the womb all the way up to birth. Then, oh, by the way, since Roe v. Wade, 1973, I think we're over 20, close to 25 million black babies have been murdered in the womb. And so how do we reconcile the fact that we have a black pastor 
that is supporting something that has really been genocidal for the black community. But who brought that out? So our messaging is so important. And I just don't see the strength of that. But we got to do a better job of, if we're going to pick certain candidates, send them to candidate charm school. I know that everybody wants to go out there and have big rallies and have people yell, yelling and cheering for them, but you got to have something between your ears to articulate the issues. So that's something else we need to look at. If the United States Army takes the time that those people that they are entrusting to lead our young men and women – at senior level command, they still send them to a little charm school. I think we can do the same in the Republican Party. And I'll close on this. There's got to be a change of leadership for the Republican National Committee. I would have hoped there would have been a change of leadership in the Senate and, and also in the House. You cannot continue to do as Albert Einstein said, do the exact same thing and think you're going to get different results. Something has to change. Or if the Republican National Committee wants to become irrelevant, that's what's going to happen. You can forget about the grassroots volunteers. You can forget about those low-dollar uh, donations, and I'm talking about $100 on down. Sure, you're going to go and get the, the big establishment type of donations, but you're not going to have the support beneath you. You're going to be a stool without legs. Can't sit on a stool without legs. So when we look at what happened in Georgia, let's learn from it and, and not just have this cursory one over. Like I say, show the documentary Uncle Tom and Uncle Tom too. It ain't about people liking you. It's about hitting them in the face with the truth. Continue to engage 24-7, 365 in the communities of color. We see an incredible awakening in the Hispanic community because we showed up here in Texas, in the Rio Grande Valley and elsewhere, and we planted the seeds, and now we're seeing the fruits of that labor. We can do the exact same thing in the black community. Don't pick candidates because of their skin color, but pick candidates because of the content of their character, their will, and their desire to stand up and fight for this great nation. If they just happen to be black or Hispanic or Asian, that's fine. But then also make sure we train them up so they can be good, strong, quality candidates. And don't ever overlook the people that are right there around you. Don't forget the United States Air Force graduate, Kelvin King, who was in the primary for the Georgia Senate race. A great young man that I think that in the state of Georgia, you should be mentoring and developing him to one day be a member of Congress, senator, maybe even governor of the state of Georgia. Steadfast and loyal. Before they burn it down.